evolution, a theory that suggests exponential change in organisms to ensure survival in their environment. But unfortunately, change rarely comes without resistance. Greetings, fanboys and fangirls. I'm Erod, and I'm the Blockbuster Buster, and our story begins in the 90s. X-Men was the biggest comic book series in the world, selling millions of copies on a monthly basis. A success that was so massive that DC literally had to kill Superman to beat their sales records. And if that wasn't enough, Marvel Productions and Fox Kids produced one of the biggest animated series of all time based on the comic. One that led to one of the most beloved and successful eras of Marvel television, which then led to a film franchise that was instrumental in the comic book movie boom. And it was because of Fox's X-Men film franchise that we got the animated series that we're talking about today. Created by Boyd Kirkland, X-Men Evolution was commissioned by 20th Century Fox as a promotional tool for the X-Men movies, which is why you might notice some gleaming similarities between this show and the film franchise. Initially, the episodes would premiere on the WB Network, and then the reruns would air on Cartoon Network right after Justice League. And while it got good ratings on both networks, it was the aforementioned primetime slot after Justice League where most people remember seeing it. And while X-Men Evolution was intended to be nothing more than a commercial for the movies, it would go on to be so much more. The Plot there are mutants among us, beings born with superhuman abilities who are believed to be the next step in our evolution. But unfortunately, humanity doesn't see them that way, as they are greatly discriminated against. So visionary mutant philanthropist Charles Xavier creates the X-Men, a team of young mutants who dedicate their extraordinary abilities to protect the very humans who fear and hate them from mutants who misuse their powers, in hopes of one day reaching a more enlightened age of tolerance and equality. However, this show would reintroduce a major concept from the comics that would set it apart from all other adaptations, which is that most of the X-Men are teenagers and are still at a stage in their lives where they are figuring out who they are. Now, why were some X-Men changed to teens and others remained adults? That can be analyzed and debated until the end of time. But personally, I feel that most of these choices worked and I respect the creator's decisions as they managed to pay tribute to the original comic, which is something that older fans would appreciate, all the while including more current plot elements that younger fans would be familiar with. So everybody wins. Character Design and Animation The characters were designed by Stephen E. Gordon that gave the X-Men new costume designs that were 100% original to this show. Now, this was mostly due to the fact that Avi Arad refused to give the producers of this show access to any of the concept art from the movies. But honestly, I think this is one of those situations where Robert E. Gordon turned lemons into lemonade because the characters in this show look awesome. My personal favorite being Wolverine, for whom he created a more modern take of his classic black and orange suit from the 80s. Now, some accuse Gordon of having a style a little too similar to Bruce Timm, which I honestly see more as a compliment than a criticism. The animation was handled by Madhouse Mook Animation in Japan, and it is pretty damn solid. It is also important to note that producers Boyd Kirkland and Frank Parr were massive fans of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And not only are most of the characters analogs of the Buffy characters, but a few sequences were directly rotoscoped from the series, the most famous one being Buffy and Faith's dance from the season 3 episode Bad Girls, which would not be the last time they would rotoscope a sequence from a live action production, namely The Craft and Coyote Ugly. Suffice it to say, this show is aesthetically gorgeous and remains one of the most impressive looking ones under the Marvel brand. Cast and characters. Okay, this show has a ton of characters, so for the sake of brevity in this section, I'm only going to cover the ones that were crucial to the series from start to finish, starting with... The Villain. There were two main villains that persisted throughout all four seasons, and the first one was Raven Darkholm, codename, mystique, power, shapeshifting, played by Colleen Wheeler. 
While the movies might only portray Mystique as one of Magneto's minions, and she does start the show that way, she eventually evolves to resemble her comic book counterpart, who is her own villain, with her own nefarious schemes and her own group of followers, namely the Brotherhood. However, what sets this version apart from other adaptations is her tumultuous relationship with her children, Nightcrawler and Rogue. <laughs> oh yeah. Save it, Mystique. Even you don't believe your excuses, so just leave us alone. Eric Magnus Lenscher, codename Magneto, power, magnetism, played by Christopher Judge. He is the other side of the mutant agenda, opting to fight for mutant supremacy rather than equality. And I have to say, as someone for whom Magneto is his all-time favorite Marvel villain, this is one of my favorite portrayals of the character. You think that by helping a few pathetic people, they will learn to accept you? You saw how quickly they turned on you today. All right, let's talk about the other side of the coin. The Heroes. The show mainly focuses on the young X-Men, so let's briefly touch upon the adults who mentor them. Like Charles Xavier, codename Professor X, Power, Telepathy, played by David K. Logan, codename Wolverine, Power, Healing Factor, played by Scott McNeil, and Aurora Monroe, codename Storm, Power, Weather Control, played by Kristen Alter. And yes, David K is primarily doing an impression of Patrick Stewart in this show, but it's still a damn good performance. These three characters are pretty much there in a support capacity to teach and guide the young X-Men and prepare them for the hardships to come. However, while Xavier and Wolverine had a few cool subplots from the comics, Storm, not as much. Look, I'm just gonna blatantly say it. Storm in this show is pretty lame. In the comics and in the original cartoon, Storm was awesome. Weather Witch, Second in Command, Punk, Goddess, Queen of Wakanda. But in the movies and the cartoons that followed, Storm became a bland, boring, one-dimensional token black character. Which really sucks and I hope changes with the upcoming revival of the 90s X-Men cartoon. But for now, let's take a look at their young counterparts, starting with Storm's nephew, Evan Daniels, codename Spike. Power, exoskeleton manipulation, and growth. Played by Neil Dennis. And yes, Storm is an orphan, so how exactly could she have a nephew? Who knows, just go with it. So Spike was exclusively created for this show. Originally, the sixth member of the team was going to be Iceman, but that was changed to make the team more racially diverse. So they gave this new character Marrow's powers and a really cool vampire's name which in part gave the creative team a character with no history or expectations that they could do whatever they wanted with, which is why Boyd Kirkland made Spike the tragic figure of the group, the one whose powers would evolve and disfigure him to the point of not being accepted by society, something that made the network very nervous. Hence the reason why it took two seasons for the creators to pull the trigger on this concept. And it was worth the wait, as it is the boldest and most memorable character arc in the show. Sorry, Antio. But this, this isn't over. And you guys don't need me. Not like they do. Kitty Pride, codename Shadow Cat. Power, phasing. Played by Maggie Blue O'Hara. Boy, that they try to push that codename. It didn't stick, everybody just calls her Kitty. She is the average teen girl of the group. She's into boys and music and fashion, and the last thing she wants is to save the world. But the beautiful thing about Kitty is that she's always there when her friends need her. <laughs> Kurt Wagner, codename Nightcrawler, power, teleportation, played by Brad Swally. So, um, full transparency, Nightcrawler is my favorite X-Man, and when I first saw this show, I hated the way he was portrayed. He was just this immature goofball, and they actually gave him a way to hide his mutation via an image inducer. It just seemed so contrary to the character that I knew and loved, but eventually, he grew on me. Nightcrawler sadly had his childhood stolen from him by intolerance and racism. 
But now, thanks to the X-Men and his image inducer, he gets to enjoy being a teen for the first time ever, which leads him to occasionally overindulge. But no matter what, Kurt is every bit the hero that I've always loved. Don't worry, I've got you! Marie, codename, rogue, power, energy absorption, played by Megan Black. So at this point in the adaptations, we've seen Sexy Southern Belle Rogue and Teenage Runaway Rogue. And now we have Goth Rogue, which seems like an odd choice until you think about it. You see, Rogue didn't start out as a badass bombshell. Originally, she was an awkward, tortured teen desperate to go unnoticed. And what would be the modern equivalent of that? A goth girl. With the ability to copy her fellow mutant's abilities through contact, Rogue is the most versatile and dangerous member of the team, but often the most isolated, making her a fan favorite and one that most people tend to relate to. Uh, 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 I just shaved my legs last night. Jean Grey, codename, Marvel Girl, power, telekinesis, and telepathy played by Venus Terso. And no, nobody calls her Marvel Girl in the show, but isn't it weird that she doesn't have a codename in any of the adaptations? And Scott Summers, codename Cyclops, Power, Optic Blast, played by Kirby Morrow. I'm grouping these two characters together for multiple reasons. The first one being that most of this show is told from their point of view. And the second reason is because these are the best adaptations of Gene and Scott out of all the movies and shows thus far. They are the overachievers, desperate to prove themselves, bearing the weight of the future of mutant kind on their shoulders, knowing that one day it will be them to take Xavier's place and lead the X-Men in future battles. In this show, we get to see them grow and develop without the need of a tired old love triangle, character deaths, or the Phoenix. We see them go from naive teens to capable adults to great heroes. And it is my humble opinion that this show's portrayal of Cyclops and Jean is its greatest attribute and what makes it required viewing for any true blue X-Men fans. You could say we've got experience on our side. Season 1 So... Again, full transparency, I didn't like this show when I first saw it, especially during the first season. Just please keep in mind that we had some really awesome action cartoons at the time, like Justice League and Samurai Jack. And while those shows were resetting the bar, here's this X-Men show where they are all teenagers going to high school, Mystique is the principal, and the Brotherhood are the bullies? Ugh. Now, in the creator's defense, this was the season where they got the most resistance from the powers that be. They had Fox pushing for the show to be more like the movies, all the while the WB wanted it to be more kid-friendly. So it's truly a testament to Kirkland and his amazing team for still managing to produce a quality show in spite of all of these ridiculous demands. Ultimately, season one is still a great introduction to the franchise meticulously introducing each character, showcasing the discovery of their powers, and more importantly, how they decide to use them, to defend or dominate. Now, while I've grown to respect and appreciate season one, I'm still not a fan of the season finale. The two-parter, The Cauldron, where Magneto pits the X-Men in one-on-one -on -one confrontations with members of the Brotherhood and the winners get to live with him on Asteroid M, whether they want to or not. And he also plans to make the winners even more powerful via the use of his genetic enhancer. Okay, so here's my issue. This plan is stupid. From Magneto's point of view, humans are the enemy. Making mutants hurt and potentially kill each other in no way serves his anti-human agenda. Secondly, as a Holocaust survivor, I find it hard to believe that Eric Lenscher would kidnap someone from their home and force them to relocate against their will. And lastly, as someone who prides himself on being one of the most powerful mutants on Earth, why the f*** 
would he want to make other mutants more powerful? And yes, the machine also brainwashes the mutants. But how long do you think it will be before Jean or Xavier figure out a way to counteract that? Like I said, it's just dumb. Season 2 Thankfully, the show gets so much better from this point on. Robert Kelly becomes the new principal of Bayville High in Mystique's absence, as tensions begin to mount on the mutant agenda. And certain covert groups even begin building countermeasures for when the situation inevitably escalates. New X-Men join the Institute, including Cannonball, Magma, Jubilee, Multiman, Berserker, Iceman, and Beast, played by Michael Kopsa. Oh, and Boom Boom. Not a fan of Boom Boom. Here, you dropped the soap. Magneto also does a little recruiting of his own. He dumps the Brotherhood and replaces them with the Acolytes. Sabretooth, Pyro, Colossus, and Gambit. Yes, Colossus and Gambit primarily work with Magneto in this show, but honestly, it's a better option than changing them into teenagers so they will fit in with the X-Men in this show. And if it's any consolation, they are reluctant bad guys, always questioning Magneto's orders and often doing whatever the hell they want behind his back. I better go. You will be fine, Sherry. You got people watching over you. Oh, and the Brotherhood adds one more member to their ranks, the Scarlet Witch. And not only was she given the most tragic backstory, but this was the first adaptation to show Wanda having the full extent of her power. This season also has what many consider to be the worst and most unintentionally hilarious episode in the series, Walk on the Wild Side where the female X-Men decide to dress like they're going to a midnight screening of Blade 2 and fight crime on their own. The silliest part is at the end, when after they save the day, a female police officer says, hey, you should leave crime fighting to us. And they're like, oh, okay. This is one of those rare episodes that the fan base initially hated, but after some time, people have come to love it for its delightful dated campiness. On the flip side of that, this season also has one of the best episodes in the show, Operation Reaper, which goes into Wolverine and Magneto's past and is the only episode to guest star a hero from another Marvel franchise, the Sentinel of Liberty himself, Captain America. Cap, I think you've met Logan. He's with Canadian Special Forces. From what I hear, he's almost as tough as you are. Alas, the season concludes with a two-parter, Day of Reckoning where Bolivar Trask unveils those mutant countermeasures that he had been working on, the Sentinels. The X-Men, the Brotherhood, and the Acolytes team up to take on this new threat. And while they win, it comes at a price, as the entire world finds out about the existence of mutants, and the X-Men's secret identities are revealed to everyone. And on top of that, the mansion is destroyed, Xavier is missing, and there's a far worse threat looming on the horizon and the world will once again tremble at the presence of Apocalypse. My god, this season was epic. Season 3 We pick up where Season 2 left off, with the X-Men on the run, as the tension of the mutant conflict has hit critical mass. Thankfully, after they stop Juggernaut from destroying a dam, humanity sees the value of having a team of colorfully dressed mutants on their side. So the president calls off the mutant hunt, and the X-Men are allowed to return to school, where now everyone is aware that they are mutants. And the first scene where they go back to school boldly references the case of the Little Rock Nine, where nine African-American students enrolled in one of the first non-segregated schools in Arkansas. I'm... I'm just not ready to be exposed as a mutant. They don't realize I'm the fuzzy one. Kurt... That means you're still hiding. Oh, and the more personal note, Wolverine stops wearing the really cool suit that he wore throughout the first two seasons and starts wearing his uniform from Ultimate X-Men. <sighs> this season creates a new series of challenges for the X-Men, because while most people know that they are heroes, there is still a vocal minority who hates them simply because they are mutants. 
and those people are often the biggest obstacles in their path. Oh, and by the way, Season 3 made the biggest contribution not just to the X-Men franchise, but to the entire Marvel Universe with the introduction of X-23. Yes, X-23, Laura Kenny, the second Wolverine, was created by writer Craig Kyle for this show. She is the Harley Quinn of Marvel, the character that was created for a cartoon, but would go on to be a beloved part of the comics. <laughs> The entire season builds up to our hero's first encounter with Apocalypse in the two-parter Dark Horizon. And um, it doesn't go well. Season 4 after Apocalypse effortlessly spanks the X-Men and their allies, he spends the bulk of the season uncovering pyramids all over the world for some nefarious purpose. The X-Men, however, are busy rebuilding the Institute as Cyclops and Jean graduate from high school and become instructors at Xavier School. Robert Kelly leaves his scholastic pursuits and begins his political career by running for mayor of Bayville under a very aggressive anti-mutant platform. And of course, the series concludes with a two-part episode, Ascension, in which we see the X-Men's final confrontation with Apocalypse, an epic battle to the end full of twists and turns that makes the X-Men Apocalypse movie look like it was made by first-year film students. A hell of an ending to one hell of a show. So we're gonna trash those pyramids any way we can, no matter who we gotta go through to do it. Final Verdict X-Men fans have this ongoing asinine debate as to which one is the best X-Men show. And I just want to ask, from the bottom of my heart, please stop. As X-Men fans, we have the great fortune of being able to claim that we have never had a bad X-Men cartoon. It's just a matter of preference. If you want something that's more faithful to the comics, check out the original show from 1992. If you want something that's serialized like a modern streaming series, check out Wolverine and the X-Men. But if you prefer your shows to be more episodic and character driven, then X-Men Evolution is the show for you. Yes, it took me a year or two to fully appreciate this show, but once I did, I couldn't unsee its beauty. This show is about great power and great responsibility even more so than Spider-Man. It's about discovering might and then dealing with the dilemma of what to do with it. A struggle that is never simple, is never easy, and is certainly never fair. In the end, all we can do is our best and hope that it leads to a better tomorrow. 10 points on the badassitude meter! Grab yourself a gut bomb, don't miss your sessions in the danger room, and give it a watch. Until next time, I'm Erod, and I'm the Blockbuster Buster.